enough, the rituals of this ability may have acted by inspiration for our own. It is always okay to not let's talk about concussion. That's a tale for another Thank you. Every nine minutes, someone in the United States is diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Every 40 seconds, another person endures a stroke. And every 23 seconds, someone endures a traumatic brain injury to the level of concussion and sometimes more severe. The bad news is nearly every single one of you listening to this will be touched either directly or indirectly by one of these three conditions in your lives. The good news is neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is the process by which the brain restores and recovers in the face of illness and injury, but it's also the process by which we learn new information. You see, neuroplasticity as a process is very similar to road construction. We make connections between cities and townships, just like neurons in the brain. And when we learn new information, maybe that's a poem that you want to memorize, how to do sign language, play a new instrument, or a movement in sports, you're making connections that your brain is storing. Those connections, just like a pathway, a road, are a little bit bumpy at first. Perhaps you start off with a dirt road, and maybe only one car can travel on it at a time. And it's not all that smooth of a ride, but with more experience and repetitions, we get better. We become more proficient. We can travel with maybe more than one car on the road at a time. We start to get proficient and experienced. We try to master something. And before long, we've got six cars traveling on an information superhighway going 60, 70, 90 miles an hour with the top rolled down and your arms waving out and your hair's blowing. And Well, you get the picture. That's what neuroplasticity is. You get good at something, you can do it quickly without thinking about it. But sometimes we run into a little bit of a problem and the road actually becomes closed. We have a blockade. And I want you to think about that in the context of a stroke where the road might be washed out by a flood. And we have to do road construction. Perhaps we're talking about a concussion where an individual's structure of their roadway has actually been shaken rather like an earthquake. And we can choose sometimes to be able to repair the very same road that we once traveled on, lay the pavement down over again. But sometimes we have to choose an alternate route. We have to go around the barricade. And that happens in the face of illness and injury. Let's talk a little bit about how this is applied. Let's meet Diana. Diana had a stroke, 2011. She was watching a football game, lost all of her function in her right arm and her right leg. For weeks and months after, she had to go through rehabilitation recovery. She used neuroplasticity to her advantage to go around this road closure. She had to learn how to walk all over again in the same context that all of us take for granted every single day, thousands of steps per day. She had to think about every single step. And Diana recovered to the point where she could walk on her own again with the use of a brace around her ankle and a walker in her hands. And she would continue to recover and use neuroplasticity until a decision by her insurance company informed her that she had recovered as much as she possibly could. And they removed her access to rehabilitation. And before long, Diana actually learned how to become reliant on the walker, learned how to become reliant on her left leg. She did something that all of you have done thousands of times in your life. She experienced learned non-use. It's also known as use it or lose it. And before long, she actually started to lose some function in her right leg without sustaining another stroke. All of you have lost information in your brains throughout your lives. Maybe it's how to say a word in Spanish or French. Maybe it's how to play a song on the piano that you once had memorized when you were nine years old. Maybe it's that neighbor that you used to live next door to 30 years ago and you couldn't actually come up with their name if you saw them on the street today. Your brain prunes out information that you no longer need. Your brain's very efficient. Neuroplasticity works both ways. 
It makes new roads and decides to close roads that you're no longer using. That's what happened to Diana's right leg. It was trustworthy for the left leg, trustworthy for the walker, and she started to lose strength in the right leg. She lost so much strength in the right leg that it became painful and unstable and unsafe to walk. She added a knee brace to her right leg at that point, and that's when I met her in 2016. We took neuroplasticity and we used it to her advantage. We gave Diana the opportunity, the demand on her brain to supply more information. Again, we wanted to repave some of those roadways, so we put her on a treadmill. We put her on a treadmill with a harness supporting her, as you see here in the video. Diana was challenged in multiple different ways to reconnect the brain, and I want you to remember that, demand and supply. We actually put a five pound weight around her weaker leg to force the brain to invigorate and repave the pathway, to know how to lift that leg again. We distracted her brain away from the task of walking so she could operate the task of walking automatically. Again, something that all of you, many of us, take for granted thousands of times per day, do it without thinking about it. And additionally, we did something that may be a portion of your exercise or fitness program. We used high-intensity interval training with her, HIT training. We took the treadmill speed up and then brought it back down, and then up even higher and brought it back down. And for brief periods of time, Diana had to walk faster than she was capable of conducting herself. These experiences gave Diana the stimulus for neuroplasticity. When she could see herself accomplishing things that she previously and recently hadn't been able to, her brain released dopamine. Dopamine, a neurotransmitter and a neuromodulator that actually is facilitatory, helps and stimulates the process of brain growth. But this process is not just viable for persons that have sustained a stroke. Let's meet Carl. Carl was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease at age 39. His specific presentation of Parkinson's disease is called freezing of gait, where Carl can be walking along and with no notice whatsoever can drop to the ground. This would happen to Carl 50 times per day, sometimes 100 times per week. When I met Carl, we needed to work together to create a new pathway around the barricade. And so we put Carl back on the treadmill and with a harness, and we made him imitate the very steps, the short stuttering steps that he would take that would lead up to a fall, and then we gave his brain the opportunity to take big steps and break out of that. That's what you're watching right now on this videotape. Watch him step on the little chalk lines that we've drawn, and then step big and be in control. And if you've been listening closely, you know that meant Carl could see himself successful again. His brain was releasing dopamine. That facilitated the process of the new wiring that we had to do around the barricade. But you see, this is also not limited to Parkinson's disease. Let's talk about concussion. Many of you might be very familiar with this because 1.3 million Americans in 2018 sustained a concussion. It might be familiar and on topic for you because the National Football League playoffs actually start today. Someone's likely to endure a concussion today in the NFL. Perhaps a loved one that you know actually has already sustained a concussion as well. We have learned so much about concussion in the last 30 years, it's dramatic to understand what we didn't know. When I graduated from physical therapy school 30 years ago, just like many of you that were alive then, we thought a concussion was just getting your bell rung or seeing some stars. And then you would just shake it off and you'd get back out onto the field and play again or get back to work or whatever you were interrupted in doing from the concussion. But we now know concussion is actually a mild traumatic brain injury. It's a disruption of the connections in your brain. And we understand better how to rehabilitate now, when a person has a concussion, we take away the cell phone, we take away the television, 
We take away the video games, or we take away the sporting activities, the parties, the loud noises, and the bright lights. We take away the classroom and the work and every activity that this person liked to do. We gotta shut the brain down. We gotta pull it together. We gotta literally sometimes put them in a dark room for two, three weeks at a time so the brain can go off on its own and neuroplasticity can just take place on its own because the brain's gonna make those connections without any... No, it's not, is it? If you've been listening to me over the last 10 minutes, you understand that I just contradicted everything I told you. No demand, no supply. How is it that people sustaining a concussion in the United States now are actually being withdrawn from everything that they liked, being given an opportunity to get depressed? It's only been six minutes ago that you learned about learn non-use. Take away everything from me and then finally return the, bra the brain back to those experiences? Learned non-use. I can't handle the lights, the screens, the noises, the motion. Let's understand concussion a little bit better. Let's meet Luke. Luke endured two concussions, a month apart, over a year before I got a chance to meet him. Luke was a teenager who was a successful soccer player and student. But because of the effects of both of those concussions, Luke couldn't play soccer. He couldn't handle the movement and the direction changes and the fast motion on the soccer pitch. He couldn't handle the noises and the distractions in the classroom, and he began to become depressed. We restored the very pathways in Luke's brain by giving him access to exercise again. And as you'll see here on this video, Luke's actually working on returning himself back to the soccer field. He's on an underwater treadmill submerged up to his chest, and we gave him exposure to exercise. That's right. Exercise to a moderate to high intensity level actually stimulates another critical process in neuroplasticity, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It's called BDNF. All it means is it's an essential protein that comes from the brain and helps foster and fertilize the growth from one neuron to another. Just the exposure to exercise was enough to get Luke going again. But you might also notice the common thread. Luke saw himself as successful, seeing himself running again, and as you noticed on the video, changing directions running sideways, running backwards. And what do you do on the soccer pitch? You've gotta be able to run every single direction. Luke saw himself hopeful, possible, capable, released dopamine. That's right, that also facilitated his recovery. So Luke is now gonna graduate from high school this year. He's still playing competitive soccer. Luke saw himself as capable. Luke recovered. What about Carl? Carl's seen here in this photo on your right, actually walking a tightrope, straight line, one foot directly in front of another while he's pouring water from one glass to another. We challenged Carl's brain to get around that pathway and he's doing it. Carl has days in a row now that he's not falling. Diana, where'd that walker go? Hey, where'd that brace go that was around her ankle? Where's the brace that was at her knee? Well, she's replacing those on a regular basis while she's working full time and still improving and training a 70 pound dog to walk on her side. These are not unique, isolated success stories though. These things are happening correctly throughout the United States in our proficient healthcare environment. But I want you to look for the opportunities when they're not happening correctly. This is scientifically based information that should be on the top of all of our brains, literally, because you're going to be impacted by one of those three conditions or multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injury. Someone that you know or love will experience one of these three conditions. And the science is very clear on this. Introduce high intensity exercise, the limitless recovery from stroke. Doesn't matter if it's been a year, two years, five years. Early introduction of exercise for persons that have sustained a concussion stimulates recovery. And as a matter of fact, this one might blow you away more than any of the others. 
High intensity exercise can actually slow the disease progression in Parkinson's disease. You see, when we are empowered with the science and the process of neuroplasticity, we're going to see less of this road closed. And you see, there's a little bit of hope. And we've kind of pushed the barricade back in this picture because we're looking to redevelop those pathways, not just see barricades. So we want to see less of this and more of this. We want to see cars traveling fast, hands waving, hair blowing. We want to see individuals recovered because the quality of life that can be restored by using neuroplasticity effectively is a terrible thing to waste. Thank you.